May I speak in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Longing for a hope-filled morning speaks powerfully into our situation at the moment. And David Emerton, who preached for us last week, began by asking what our hopes are in this present time, the things that we're longing for. It's a particularly powerful question, of course, during this time of difficulty when many people are suffering badly and things are really not as we would want them to be. We can feel impatient, desperate even, for things to change, and particularly when a situation goes on for a long time. This week we have seen the passing of the significant milestone of more than 100,000 deaths in the UK from Covid. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, was interviewed on the BBC and it was great to hear the Christian response given such prominence as part of the BBC report. I thought Justin spoke very powerfully of the need to be alongside people, acknowledging and sharing in lament and grief. And in his interview, Justin Welby was asked where he found hope. He pointed to the three things. The hope, firstly and most importantly, that's at the heart of the Christian story, the hope of resurrection that we will celebrate at Easter, that death does not have the final word and that life is so much more than we can see or understand now. Secondly, he spoke of the hope that we have through seeing simple acts of love and kindness around us, people giving of themselves in so many ways and in different roles to help one another, whole communities coming together to offer support in ways that perhaps they previously haven't done so. Again, something so central to the Christian message, the love that Jesus modelled and commanded his disciples to follow, love one another, love your neighbour as yourself. And thirdly, Justin spoke too of the hope that he saw in the discomfort that many people feel about the way things are at the moment. Inequalities and injustice that have been revealed have now prompted a desire, particularly among younger generations, to see a better world for everyone. So how does all this relate to the Bible readings that we've heard today? Firstly, from Malachi, we heard how God was sending a messenger to let the people know that the Lord who you seek will suddenly come to his temple. That was what the people then were longing for. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, and he was a prophet writing after the exile. Some of the Jewish people had been allowed to return to Jerusalem and the temple had been rebuilt. But it was nothing like in the former days of glory. They'd been ravaged by war, they were still an occupied country, and the temple was nothing like it once had been. And they were longing for God to return to the temple. It was a symbolic place of God's home amongst the Jewish people, a sign that they were his people. And Malachi says, indeed he is coming, but who can abide the day of his coming? Don't think this is going to be easy. God is holy and his love for us isn't just cosy and comfortable. True love isn't like that, is it? Sometimes it's tough. Love wants the best for the other person, and in wanting the best for us, God wants to work with us to transform, refine, purify our lives. That can be quite uncomfortable, but ultimately it's what we want and need, and we can trust in God to do that lovingly, patiently, slowly shaping us back into his ways of righteousness, justice, mercy and love, back to the way we were meant to be, back to the way the world is meant to be. And then there's the story of Simeon and Anna, told on this Sunday every year. I come to stand deliberately next to this window that shows the picture of Simeon and I think Mary. We've jumped forward a few hundred years from Malachi and we find the Jewish people now under Roman occupation but still waiting and longing for God's intervention, 
to send a saviour, the Messiah, to bring them freedom and restoration. It's been bad enough living through a year of pandemic. Imagine a few hundred years. Not that nothing ever happened in that time. There were ups and downs and rebellions that were significant within Jewish history. But there was nothing that significant of God's intervention to make it into the main canon and stories of, of scripture. Generations had passed. And I guess that each generation lived through trials of its own. There's something about living our own story within the times and the context that we find ourselves. We cannot know the bigger picture of which we're only a small part. That only comes with hindsight. And even then, I think we sometimes only get a partial view. Live your own story in the times when you find yourself. So let's think for a moment about that particular story for Simeon and Anna within their times. One way to do that is to imagine yourself as the character, exploring the thoughts and feelings that you may have had if you were in their shoes. Nick Fawcett is a Christian writer who does just that, writing meditations from the perspective of Bible characters. And so with Nick's permission, Rosemary is going to read for us a meditation and prayer from the perspective of Anna, an old lady who had known sorrow and sadness and worshipped at the temple constantly. I think it gets to the heart of how it may have felt to have waited so long. I really felt I'd missed it, truthfully. I mean, I wasn't just old, I was ancient. And still there was no sign of the Messiah, no hint of his coming. I began to wonder whether all those years of praying and fasting had been worth it, or simply one almighty waste of time. I doubted everything, questioned everything, despite my out outward piety. Why hadn't God answered my prayers? Why hadn't he rewarded my faithfulness? Why believe when it didn't seem to make a set crop of difference? I still kept up the facade, mind you, spoke excitedly of the future, of all that God would do, but I didn't have much faith in it, not after so many disappointments. Until that day, when hobbling back through the temple after yet more prayers, suddenly I saw him, God's promised Messiah. Don't ask me how I knew, I just did, without any shadow of doubt. And it was the most wonderful moment of my life. A privilege beyond words. It taught me something, that experience. It taught me never to give up, never to let go, never to lose heart. It taught me there is always reason to hope, no matter how futile it all seems. It taught me to go on expecting, despite all the blows life may dish out. It taught me God has never finished however much it may feel like it. I nearly lost tight of that. I was right on the edge, teetering on the brink, fearing God had passed me by. But he'd saved the best to last. And I know, even though the waiting is over, that there's more to come, more to expect, more to celebrate. For though my life is nearly at an end, it has only just begun. Let us pray. Loving God, as the years go by and life drifts on, sometimes we too, like Anna, find it hard to keep faith alive. As we face life's repeated disappointments, as prayer after prayer seems to go unanswered, so faith falters. The dreams of youth, dulled by the reality of experience. Yet you tell us through Jesus never to stop looking forward, never to stop believing in the future. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to go on trusting in the victory of your love and the coming of your kingdom, despite everything that seems to de deny it. Amen. 
Thank you, Rosemary. May we be people who keep looking forward and trusting in Jesus to bring us into a new future. And may we work with him in that so our lives are transformed and we can then bring transformation to the world. Not just going back to how things were, but building a better world of justice and joy. I've been thinking a lot about what that means for St Mary's as we look to rebuild, hopefully, through this coming year and beyond. I think patience is going to be key. Changes will be gradually and gradual and may take longer than we would like. It's something God's working on in me, I think. But patience gives us time to engage with the treasures of the time we're in and so gives space for a deeper transformation to take place. It also allows time for recovery. Just like after an operation, we will need time to recover from the trauma of what we've been through, to regroup, and give ourselves time to celebrate, to rest and to grieve together. But as anyone who's had an operation knows, recovery isn't just about resting and looking back. Nurses are very eager to get you out of bed. It's about looking forward and preparing to rebuild through physio or whatever. We build up new patterns of behaviour and strength to see us into a new future. Now, what that future might be for us here at St Mary's is something that will emerge largely as we live into it but we do have an indication of what it might be in the vision statement that we came to together at the end of 2019. Our vision for St Mary's is to be a community of deep faith, relevant and accessible to all, and that reaches beyond its building. And within that, we identified three priorities that I'd like to remind you of and ask you to pray about over the next three weeks. We're going to be thinking about them. The first one to think about today is that we should be an open church. And our thoughts here were centred around good use of our particular location, the buildings and the woodland that God has given us, and our setting on the edge of Loughborough. We talked about literally being more open with midweek activities and a parish office on site. In the handover from Joanne to Joe as parish administrator, we've put much of the church office equipment and the archives into the upstairs room of the chapter house. Along with the hymn books, it's something we're really going to have to sort out once we begin to return to the building. And that for me affirms what we thought the vision was saying about the need for us to improve and extend our facilities to be welcoming and accessible for people of all ages and disabilities. Also, whatever changes we might make, I think should be environmentally sound, eco-friendly, in support of the fifth mark of mission to care for God's creation, something that's really become a crisis in our world and that is a major contributor to poverty and injustice. I've talked about recovery and I think we may have a role to play in offering a place for healing and recovery to groups in the community. Our setting here and our loving church community lends itself to offering a welcoming and safe place to people it's on the edge of the town and so away from it all, and yet so easily accessible. These ideas are tiny seeds beginning to grow. I'm not sure they've even appeared above the soil yet. But I'd love to talk to anyone who has felt inspired by what I'm sharing with you so that we can continue to explore together and to pull together a group to begin to look at what we might do with our buildings within the context always of being open and accessible to serve our community. And so now, thinking about our hopes and our dreams and all that we long to see, we remember about how we keep our focus first and foremost on Christ as our light. And we're going to sing that beautiful hymn, Christ Be Our Light. <laughs> 